So this year, when, so for this championships, we had over 100 million players watch the championships in Paris, but globally, online, watching the game, we're about 100, over 100 million players. It was more, more players watched that championship than watched the American Super Bowl that year. Mm -hmm. The American Professional Football League made about $20 billion that year. Riot, I won't tell you how much, but it was far less than $20 billion. Yep. And so I believe, personally believe, that esports will close that gap. Uh, the way that I, I, I spent seven years at Riot, and I love Riot. I, the way that I got there was I sold my second games company to Riot, and the thing I worked on most at Riot was bringing League of Legends to multiple platforms out of PC, so console, mobile. The reason that I left, me and so we sort of, me and my, my partner, my co-founder, Steven Snow, um, we took a break and then we were trying to figure out where do, we, where do we go from there? Do we go back to Riot or do we start our own company? Do we go to another games company? But so the two of us had left Riot um, and we were thinking about going back. We were thinking about starting something new. And there were kind of two, two reasons that we started Believer. The first one is the product reason. So the, the product thesis for Believer as a company is around what we call next generation open world games. Open world games are things like Zelda, The Witcher, Elden Ring, Skyrim. Um, and we love that genre, but it's been very dominated by um, a single player box product mindset. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, as a player, I want to play The Witcher and have it never end. Mm -hmm. I want to play Zelda and have it never end. That's number one. Number two, I want to share that world with my friends. I want to play meaningfully, cooperatively um, in those worlds with my friends. And those things seem very obvious, but it's actually really difficult. Mm -hmm. An excellent open world game costs at, at least $200 million to make. It takes at least five years to make. Mm -hmm. It takes at least three to 500 of the best game developers in the world to make them. And so we, we decided that starting from that, we should be respectful of how difficult this was going to be, and mm -hmm. we decided to create a new company, really, to be f like completely focused on that mission. The second reason, and this does go directly back to what makes Riot so special, when we were, th when we were thinking about all the things that we could do, there was only one games company in the world that we would be proud to work, and it was Riot. Right. Um, I think there is no, and that's still true today, there is no games company in the world that I would still be proud to work at other than Riot Games. And, and it's because rioters and the company bleed <laughs> and strive for players on behalf of players in a way that is unbelievable and it is unmatched anywhere else in the industry. And I'm not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with the the, the how perilous it is to have only one company in the world um, to make games, because all I want to do is make games. Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with the idea that there's only one I could do that and be proud to, to do that work. There's a very difficult thing about big companies, which is called the innovator's dilemma. It's almost inescapable. It's like physics. It's like the physics of, of um, technology or knowledge work. The more you become a big company, the harder it is to be able to take those risks mm -hmm the harder it is to be able to marshal the world's best talent against a mission, and the harder it is to stay focused on that mission. Mm -hmm. At Riot, it was, I think Riot in principle wa also wanted to make next generation open world games, but also we knew, and I mean, I reported to the CEO, we talked often about it, and we knew it was actually going to be really difficult for Riot to do for a lot of these innovator, innovators' dilemmas, mm -hmm. problems. And it, that makes it even harder to take huge risks and um, the, bigger, the bigger you want to do something disruptive, which we want to do at Believer, which is next generation open world games, the more it is important to be able to take those risks and the harder it is to do at a big company. So the first thing I'll say is I'm religious about games. I'm religious about games as, as a kind of entertainment, as an industry. Um, I'm religious about gamers as an audience. I love all of those things. So I know I'm a little irrational about it, but I want to show you a little data. So this first piece of data shows that really clearly uh, the end of this is 2021. It's probably continued to increase in 2022 and 2023. 
Games are by far the largest entertainment industry. They are bigger than music and movies combined. They're probably, the latest data shows that they're probably bigger than, than music, movies, and television combined. So basically the number one category and, and bigger than all the other ones all put together. So this is um, from Andreessen Horowitz, um, John Lai at Andreessen Horowitz. I love this slide. They did a survey of the top game studios in the world right now, asking them what they think about AI. And so just to walk through the, walk through the data, a vast majority of, of game studios right now are using AI. Almost all of them plan to use AI in the future. Right now, we think on a scale of 10, 6.7, how, you know, how good and transformational is it now, expect it to be at a nine or above in 10 years. And that's a huge consensus from game developers that AI is a massive, uh, has a massive impact on how we make games. Um, in the history of games, there have been, up till now, there have been three massive transformational evolutions in technology. The first is the personal computer, the second was the internet, and the third was smartphones. Smartphones, which is when I got, I started my first company around the aspiration to make smartphone games. Smartphones completely changed the landscape for who plays games. Mm -hmm. it's, what, it's what's driven that huge growth. Because, who, where, yeah, when. Who, who, where, when, how, yes, absolutely. And it's made a massive impact on the consumption of games. What it didn't change very much is the production of games. How do we make games mm -hmm. and who makes games? AI changes all of that. AI changes dramatically how we make games and who can make games, similar to the way that the personal computer changed who makes games and, and how do they make games. And so it's a massive, massive shift. It's only a small list of the things because over time, really every part of game development is going to be impacted. Um, art, game design, engineering, um, e every part of, of the value chain is going to be impacted in a positive way. Because what that does is create such a high leverage um, for anybody who wants to make games. Um, it will make indie games and indie game developers much more empowered. I'll give you one example because it's, it's very notable. Traditionally, the way that we've made NPC, so non-player character, yep. enemy a AI um, in games um, has relied on, basically the technology that's been used to do that has been stagnant for decades. Mm -hmm. The current generation of AI and machine learning gives us a new technique, um, a couple of them that are really important. One of them is reinforcement, um, RLHF, reinforcement-based learning with human feedback, and then um, generative adversarial networks. And what you have with those two technologies is the capability to have a game, to have a game enemy, like a bad guy or a boss, play the game against itself hmm. many, many, many times, and learn to create its own intelligence to be responsive to the player. Learn to create its own ingenuity. And if the enemy and the world becomes in itself ingenious and creative, then it creates a much more rich tapestry for the player to be able to interact. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to compare it to like Elden Ring I gave as an example, I love that, I love that game, I love Dark Souls games, but it comes down to knowing, already knowing what the boss is gonna do. Mm -hmm. The thing that's magical about the current generation of AI is that you don't necessarily know, and the boss might not know what you're going to do either. And the fact that you, you have the capability to have like a much more meaningful and creative mm -hmm. emergent interaction with the characters in the game world and the enemies in the game world is so huge. All right, so we've talked about um, Rachel and Barbara, right, Games and Believer, um, and then we talked about how gaming is still important in the era of Techno Big Bang, and we talked about uh, games and technologies, in particular AI. I want to switch gears a little bit and then talk about game and business. So you mentioned that gaming is the biggest form of entertainment in the world right now. Do you think there's still room for growth? So this is about a 70-year-old image, and this was drawn by Walt Disney back in the 1950s. And this is him mapping out what he sees is the, the ecosystem of Disney IP. At the center of it lives feature films, and that's where they generate these new IPs, Snow White, Cinderella, etc. 
Um, and then, it, then those IPs flow throughout the rest of the ecosystem. They go to television, they go to music, they go to books and comics, um, they go to physical merchandise, and then they go to Disneyland, the amusement parks. And this model, Disney in particular, has dominated the entertainment industry for, you know, basically since that time, for about 70 years. The thing that, that really became magical about Riot in its aspirations was to put games at the center instead of feature films and to have, and in, instead of being this kind of ecosystem, it has games at the center and they're driven by television and film and sport and music on the outside. So this is Senna. She is probably my favorite thing I've ever worked on in my, in my 16 years in the games industry. Um, she's a character we launched in 2018 um, with the World Championships um, in Paris at the time. With Senna, we released um, a music video, which is a hip-hop music video, we, and we collaborated with Louis Vuitton. And it was this incredible, massive moment that combined the sport um, with music, um, with uh, fashion, and to me, w the places that games can continue to grow um, will be into these other adjacent um, regions of both creativity and entertainment. The global sports industry is about a $500 billion industry. And I think that esports take up about a billion to two billion of that. But it could be way larger. So this year, when, so for this championships, we had over 100 million players watch the championships in Paris. But globally, online, watching the game, we're about 100, over 100 million players. It was more, more players watched that championship than watched the American Super Bowl that year. Mm -hmm. The American Professional Football League made about $20 billion that year. Riot, I won't tell you how much, but it was far less than $20 billion. Yep. And so to me, it rep there are a bunch of differences between League of Legends, the sport, and the NFL. But it shows that massive gap in the growth of the market um, in terms of its potential. And so I believe, personally believe, that esports will close that gap. It might take... 10 years for it to happen, it might take longer, but I know, I believe it will be inevitable. The one other thing I'll say, now that we're back on this slide, Disneyland. <laughs> so, I don't think that the potential for games is to make physical amusement parks like Disneyland. Mm -hmm. However, I believe that part of the metaverse hype mm -hmm. that we've seen is around this, at least a virtual place for players to inhabit and belong. And that's a that's one of the key things that is actually part of the believer vision mm -hmm. is that we want to create worlds for players to actually join and inhabit together with their friends. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of, like, in, in some ways, instead of putting games at the center, we're taking the Disneyland piece and putting that at the center in terms of game worlds right. that we want to put at the center of the believer eco, uh, entertainment ecosystem. And I believe that's the true power of like of the metaverse vision is is places for players to belong together yeah